Chapter Thirty One of Gunsight Pass: How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two on the hilltops. It was the morning after his return. Emerson Crawford helped himself to another fried egg from the platter and shook his knife at the bright-eyed girl opposite. "I tell you, honey, the boy's a wonder," he insisted. "Knows what he wants and goes right after it." Don't waste any words. Don't beat around the bush. Don't let anyone bluff him out. Graham says if I don't want him, he'll give him a responsible job pronto. The girl's trim head tilted to her father in a smile of sweet derision. She was pleased, but she did not intend to say so. I believe you're in love with Dave Sanders, Dad. It's about time for me to be jealous. Crawford defended himself. He's had a hard row to hoe, and he's coming out fine. I aim to give him every chance in the world to make good. It's up to us to stand by him. If he'll let us. Joyce jumped up and ran round the table to him. They were alone, Keith having departed with a top to join his playmates. She sat on the arm of his chair, straight, slim creature, very much alive, and pressed her face of flushed loveliness against his head. It won't be your fault, old duck, if things don't go well with him. You're good the best ever a jim dandy friend but he's so so oh i don't know stiff as a poker acts as if he doesn't want to be friends as if we're all ready to turn against him he makes me good and tired dad why can't he be human now joy you got to remember that he was in prison and had an awful time of it oh yes i remember all that he won't let us forget it it's just like he held us off all the time and insisted on us not forgetting it. I just like to shake the foolishness out of him. A rueful little laugh welled from her throat at the thought. He can't be gay as Bob Hard all at once. Give him time. You're so partial to him you don't see when he's doing wrong. But I see it. Yesterday he hardly spoke when I met him. Ridiculous. It's all right for him to hold back and be kind of reserved with outsiders, but with his friends? You and Bob and old Buck Byington and me, he ought not to shut himself up in an ice cave, and I'm going to tell him so. The cattleman's arm slid around her warm young body and drew her close. She was to him the dearest thing in the world, a never-failing, exquisite wonder and mystery. Sometimes even now he was amazed that this rare spirit had found the breath of life through him. "'You want to remember you're a little lady,' he reproved. "'You wouldn't want to do anything you'd be sorry for, honeybug.' "'I'm not so sure about that,' she flushed, amusement rippling her face. "'Someone's got to blow up that young man like a Dutch uncle, and I think I'm elected. I'll try not to think about being a lady. Then I can do my full duty, Dad.' It'll be fun to see how he takes it. Now, now, he remonstrated. It's all right to be proud, she went on. I wouldn't want to see him hold his head any lower. But there's no sense in being so offish that even his friends have to give him up. And that's what it'll come to if he acts the way he does. Folks will stand just so much. Then they give up trying. I reckon you're right about that, Joy. Of course I'm right. You have to meet your friends halfway. Well, if you talk to him, don't hurt his feelings. There was a glint of mirth in her eyes, almost of friendly malice. I'm going to worry him about my feelings, Dad. He'll not have time to think of his own. Joyce found her chance next day. She met David Sanders in front of a drug store. He would have passed with a bow if she had let him. What does the oil expert Mr. Graham sent think of our property? she asked presently greetings having been exchanged he hasn't given out any official opinion yet but he's impressed the report will be favorable i think isn't that good couldn't be better he admitted it was a warm day joyce glanced at the soda fountain and said demurely my but it's hot won't you come in and have an ice cream soda on me dave flushed if you'll go as my guest he said stiffly how good of you to invite me, she accepted, laughing, but with a tint of warmer color in her cheeks. Rhythmically, she moved beside him to a little table in the corner of the drug store. I own stock in the jackpot. You've got to give an accountant to me. Have you found a market yet? The whole southwest will be our market as soon as we can reach it. 
and when will that be she asked i'm having some hauled to relieve the glut the railroad will be operating inside of six weeks we'll keep number three capped till then and go on drilling in other locations burns is spudding in a new well today the clerk took their order and departed they were quite alone not within hearing of anybody joyce took her fear by the throat and plunged in you mad at me mr sanders she asked jauntily you know i'm not how do i know it she asked innocently you say as little to me as you can and get away from me as quick as you can yesterday for instance you'd hardly say good morning i didn't mean to be rude i was busy dave felt acutely uncomfortable i'm sorry if i didn't seem sociable so was mr hart busy but he had time to stop and say a pleasant word the brown eyes challenged their vis-a-vis -vis steadily the young man found nothing to say he could not explain that he had not lingered because he was giving bob a chance to see her alone nor could he tell her that he felt it better for his peace of mind to keep away from her as much as possible i'm not in the habit of inviting young men to invite me to take a soda mr sanders she went on this is my first offense i never did it before and i never expect to again i do hope the new well will come in a good one the last sentence was for the benefit of the clerk returning with the ice cream looks good said dave playing up smut's showing and you know that's a first-class sign bob said it was expected in today or tomorrow i ask you because i have something to say to you something i think one of your friends ought to say and i'm gonna do it she concluded in a voice modulated just to reach him the clerk had left the glasses and the check he was back at the fountain polishing the counter sanders waited in silence he had learned to let the burden of conversation rest on his opponent and he knew that joyce just now was in that class she hesitated uncertain of her opening then you're disappointing your friends mr sanders she said lightly he did not know what an effort it took to keep her voice from quavering her hand from trembling as it rested on the onyx top of the table i'm sorry he said a second time perhaps it's our fault perhaps we haven't been friendly enough the lifted eyes went straight into his he found an answer unexpectedly difficult no man has ever had more generous friends he said at last brusquely his face set hard the girl guessed at the tense feeling back of his words let's walk she replied and he noticed that the eyes and mouth had softened to a tender smile i can't talk here dave they made a pretense of finishing their sodas then walked out of the town into the golden autumn sunlight of the foothills neither of them spoke she carried herself buoyantly chin up her face a flushed cameo of loveliness as she took the uphill trail a small breath of wind wrapped the white skirt about her slender limbs he found in her a new note one of unaccustomed shyness the silence grew at last too significant she was driven to break it i suppose i'm foolish she began haltingly but i had been expecting all of us had that when you came home from from denver the first time i mean you would be the old dave sanders we all knew and liked we wanted our friendship to to help make up to you for what you must have suffered we didn't think you would hold us off like this his eyes narrowed he looked away at the cedars on the hills painted in lustrous blues and greens and purples and at the slopes below burnt to exquisite color lights by the fires of fall but what he saw was a gray prison wall with armed men in the towers if i could tell you he said in a whisper to himself but she just caught the words won't you try she said ever so gently he could not sully her innocence by telling of the furtive whisperings that had fouled the prison life made of it an experience degrading and corrosive he told her instead of the externals of that existence of how he had risen dressed eaten worked exercised and slept under orders he described to her the cells four by seven by seven barred built in tiers faced by narrow iron balconies each containing a stool a chair a shelf a bunk in his effort to show her the chasm that separated him from her he did not spare himself at all dryly and in clean-cut strokes 
he showed her the sordidness of which he had been the victim and left her to judge for herself of its evil effect on his character when he had finished he knew that he had failed she wept for pity and murmured you poor boy you poor boy he tried again and this time he drew the moral don't you see i'm a marked man marked for life he hesitated then pushed on you're fine and clean and generous what a good father and mother and all this have made you he swept his hand round in wide gesture to include the sun and the hills and all the brave life of the open if i come too near you don't you see i taint you i'm a man who was shut up because fiddlesticks you're a man who's been done a wrong you mustn't grow morbid over it after all you've been found innocent that isn't what counts i've been in the penitentiary nothing can wipe that out the stain of it's on me and can't be washed away she turned on him with a little burst of feminine ferocity how dare you talk that way dave sanders i want to be proud of you we all do but how can we be if you give up like a quitter don't we all have to keep beginning our lives over and over again aren't we all forever getting into trouble and getting out of it a man is as good as he makes himself it doesn't matter what outside things have happened to him don't you dare tell me that my dad wouldn't be worth loving if he'd been in prison forty times the color crept into his face i'm not quitting i'm going through the point is whether i'm to ask my friends to carry my load for me what are your friends for she demanded and her eyes were like stars in a field of snow don't you see it's an insult to assume they don't want to stand with you in your trouble you've been warped you're eaten up with vain pride joyce bit her lip to choke back a swelling in her throat the dave sanders we used to know wasn't like that he was friendly and sweet when folks were kind to him he was kind to them he wasn't like like an old poker she fell back helplessly on the simile she had used with her father i don't blame you for feeling that way he said gently when i first came out i did think i'd play a lone hand i was hard and bitter and defiant but when i met you all again and found you were just like home folks all of you so kind and good far beyond any claims i had on you why miss joyce my heart went out to my old friends with a rush it sure did maybe i had to be stiff to keep from being mushy oh if that's it her eager face flushed and tender nodded approval but you've got to look at this my way too he urged i can't repay your father's kindness yes and yours too by letting folks couple your name even in friendship with a man who she turned on him glowing with color now that's absurd dave sanders i'm not a a nice little china doll i'm a flesh and blood girl and i'm not a statue on a pedestal i gotta live just like other people the trouble with you is that you want to be generous but you don't want to give other folks a chance to be let's stop this foolishness and be sure enough friends dave he took her outstretched hand in his brown palm smiling down at her all right i know when i'm beaten she beamed that's the first honest-to-goodness smile i've seen on your face since you came back i got millions of em in my system he promised i've been hoarding them up for years don't hoard them any more spend them she urged i'll take that prescription dr joyce and he spent one as evidence of good faith the soft and shining oval of her face rippled with gladness as a mountain lake sparkles with sunshine and a light summer breeze i found again that dave boy i lost she told him you won't lose him again he answered pushing into the hinterland of his mind the reflection that a man cannot change the color of his thinking in an hour we thought he'd gone away for good i'm so glad he hasn't no he's been here all the time but he's been obeying the orders of a man who told him he had no business to be alive he looked at her with deep inscrutable eyes as a boy he had been shy but impulsive the fires of discipline had given him remarkable self-restraint she could not tell he was finding in her face the quality to inspire in a painter a great picture 
the expression of that brave young faith which made her a touchstone to find the gold in his soul yet in his gravity was something that disturbed her blood was she fanning to flame banked fires better dormant she felt a compunction for what she had done maybe she had been unwomanly it is a penalty impulsive people have to pay that later they must consider whether they have been bold and presumptuous her spirits began to drop when she should logically have been celebrating her success but dave walked on mountain tops tipped with mellow gold he threw off the weight that had oppressed his spirits for years and was for the hour a boy again she had exercised the gloom in which he walked he looked down on a magnificent flaming desert and it was good to-day was his to-morrow was his all the to-morrows of the world were in his hand he refused to analyze the causes of his joy it was enough that beside him moved with charming diffidence the woman of his dreams that with her soft hands she had torn down the barrier between them and now i don't know whether i've done right she said ruefully dad warned me i'd better be careful but of course i always know best i rush in you've done me a million dollars worth of good i needed some good friend to tell me just what you have please don't regret it well i won't she added in a hesitant murmur you won't misunderstand his look turned aside the long-lashed eyes and brought a faint flush of pink to her cheeks no i'll not do that he said End of chapter 31Chapter 32 of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dave Becomes an Office Man. From Graham came a wire a week after the return of the oil expert to Denver. It read Report Satisfactory. Can you come at once and arrange with me plan of organization? Sanders was on the next train. He was still much needed at Malapi to look after getting supplies and machinery and to arrange for a wagon train of oil teams, but he dropped or delegated this work for the more important call that had just come. His contact with Graham uncovered a new side of the state builder, one that was to impress him in all the big businessmen he met they might be pleasant socially and bear him a friendly good will but when they met to arrange details of a financial plan they always wanted their pound of flesh graham drove a hard bargain with him he tied the company fast by legal control of its affairs until his debt was satisfied he exacted a bonus in the form of stock that fairly took the breath of the young man with whom he was negotiating they fought him round by round and found the great man smooth and impervious as polished agate yet dave liked him when they met at lunch as they did more than once the grizzled westerner who had driven a line of steel across almost impassable mountain passes was simple and frank in talk he had taken a fancy to this young fellow and he let him know it perhaps he found something of his own engaging dogged youth in the strong-jawed range rider does a financier always hog-tie a proposition before he backs it dave asked him once with a sardonic gleam in his eye always no matter how much he trusts the people he's doing business with he binds them hard and fast just the same it's the only way to do give away as much money as you want to but when you loan money look after your security like a hawk even when you're dealing with friends especially when you're dealing with friends corrected the older man otherwise you're likely not to have your friends long don't believe i want to be a financier decided sanders it takes the hot blood out of you admitted graham i'm not sure if i had my life to live over again knowing what i know now that i wouldn't choose the outdoors like west and crawford sanders was very sure which choice he would like to make he was at present embarked on the business of making money through oil but some day he meant to go back to the serenity of a ranch there were times when he left the conferences with graham or his lieutenants sick at heart because of the uphill battle he must fight to protect his associates from denver he went east to negotiate for some oil tanks and material with which to construct reservoirs 
His trip was a flying one. He entrained for Malapi once more to look after the loose ends that had been accumulating locally in his absence. A road had to be built across the desert. Contracts must be let for hauling away the crude oil. A hundred details awaited his attention. He worked day and night. Often he slept only a few hours. He grew lean in body and curt of speech. Lines came into his face that had not been there before. But at his work, apparently, he was tireless as steel springs. Meanwhile, Brad Steelman molded to undermine the company. Dave's men finished building a bridge across a gulch late one day. It was blown up into kindling wood by dynamite that night. Wagons broke down unexpectedly. Shipments of supplies failed to arrive. Engines were mysteriously smashed. The sabotage was skillful. Steelman's agents left no evidence that could be used against them. More than one of them, Hart and Sanders agreed, were spies who had found employment with the jackpot. One or two men were discharged on suspicion, even though complete evidence against them was lacking. The responsibility that had been thrust on Dave brought out in him unsuspected business capacity. During his prison days, there had developed in him a quality of leadership. He had been more than once in charge of a road-building gang of convicts and had found that men naturally turned to him for guidance. But not until Crawford had shifted to his shoulders the burdens of the jackpot did he know that he had it in him to grapple with organization on a fairly large scale. He worked without nerves, day in, day out, concentrating in a way that brought results. He never let himself get impatient with details. Thoroughness had long since become the habit of his life. To this he added a sane common sense. Jackpot number four came in a good well, though not a phenomenal one like its predecessor. Number five was already halfway down to the sands. Meanwhile the railroad crept near. Malappy was already talking of its big celebration when the first engine should come to town. Its council had voted to change the name of the place to Bonanza. The tide was turning against Steelman. He was still a very rich man, but he seemed no longer to be a lucky one. He brought in a dry well. On another location, the cable had pulled out of the socket, and a forty-foot auger stem and bit lay at the bottom of a hole fifteen hundred feet deep. His best producer was beginning to cough a weak and intermittent flow, even under steady pumping. And to add to his troubles, a quiet little man had dropped into town to investigate one of his companies. He was a government agent, and the rumor was that he was gathering evidence. Sanders met Thomas on the street. He had not seen him since the prospector had made his wild ride for safety with the two outlaws hard on his heels. "'Glad you made it, Mr. Thomas,' said Dave. "'Good bit of strategy. "'When they reached the notch, Shorty and Doble never once looked to see if we were around. "'They lit out after you on the jump. "'Did they come close to getting you? "'It looked like bullets would be flying. "'I won't say who would have got who if they had,' he said modestly. "'But I was looking for no trouble. "'I don't aim to be one of these here fire-eaters, "'but I'll fight like a wildcat when I got to.' The prospector looked defiantly at Sanders, bristling like a bantam which had been challenged. "'We certainly owe you something for the way you drew the outlaws off our trail,' Dave said gravely. "'Say, have you heard how the government is getting after Steelman? He's a wily bird, old Brad is, but he slipped up when he sent out his advertising for the great mogul. A photographer faked a gusher for him, and they sent it out on the circulars.' Sanders nodded without comment. "'Steelman can make him flow on paper, anyhow.' thomas chortled but he's sure in a kettle of hot water this time mr steelman is enterprising dave admitted dryly say mr sanders have you heard what's become of shorty and doble the prospector asked lapsing into ill-concealed anxiety i see the sheriff has got a handbill out offering a reward for their arrest and conviction you don't reckon these fellows would bear me any grudge do you no but i wouldn't travel in the hills alone if i were you if you happen to meet them, they might make things unpleasant. They are both killers. I'm a peaceable citizen, as the fellow says. Of course, if they crowd me to the wall, they won't, Dave assured him. He knew that the outlaws, if the chance ever came for them, would strike at higher game than Thomas. They would try to get either Crawford or Sanders himself. 
The treasurer of the jackpot did not fool himself with any false promises of safety. The two men in the hills were desperate characters, game as any in the country, gunfighters, and they owed both him and Crawford a debt they would spare no pains to settle in full. Some day there would come an hour of accounting. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of Gunside Pass: How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the Dodge. Up in the hills back of Bear Canyon, two men were camping. They breakfasted on slow elk, coffee, and flour and water biscuits. When they had finished, they washed their tin dishes with sand in the running brook. Might's well be hitting the trail, one growled. The other nodded without speaking, rose lazily, and began to pack the camp outfit. Presently, when he had arranged the load to his satisfaction, he threw the diamond hitch and stood back to take a chew of tobacco while he surveyed his work. He was a squat, heavy-set man with a chihuahua hat. Also, he was a two-gun man. After a moment, he circled a narrow weed thicket and moved into the chaparral where his horse was hobbled. The man who had spoken rose with one lithe twist of his big body. His eyes, hard and narrow, watched the shorter man disappear in the brush. Then he turned swiftly and strode toward the shoulder of the ridge. In the heavy undergrowth of dry weeds and grass he stopped and tested the wind with a bandana handkerchief. The breeze was steady and fairly strong. It blew down the canyon toward the foothills beyond. The man stripped from a scrub oak a handful of leaves. They were very brittle and crumbled in his hand. A match flared out. His palm cupped it for a moment to steady the blaze before he touched it to the crisp foliage. Into a nest of twigs he thrust the small flame. The twigs, dry as powder from a four-month's drought, crackled like miniature fireworks. The grass caught, and a small line of fire ran quickly out. The man rose. On his brown face was an evil smile. In his hard eyes something malevolent and sinister. The wind would do the rest. He walked back toward the camp. At the shoulder crest he turned to look back. From out of the chaparral a thin column of pale gray smoke was rising. His companion stamped out the remains of the breakfast fire and threw dirt on the ashes to make sure no live ember could escape in the wind. Then he swung to the saddle. "'Ready, Doug?' he asked. The big man growled an assent and followed him over the summit into the valley beyond. "'Country needs rain bad,' the man in the chihuahua hat commented. "'Don't know as I recollect a drier season.' The big hawk-nosed man by his side cackled in his throat with short splenetic mirth. "'It'll be some drier before the rains,' he prophesied. They climbed out of the valley to the rim. The short man was bringing up the rear along the narrow trail ribbon. He turned in the saddle to look back, a hand on his horse's rump. Perhaps he did this because the power of suggestion. Several times Doble had already swung his head to scan with a searching gaze the other side of the valley. Mackerel clouds were floating near the horizon in a sky of blue. Was that or was it not smoke just over the brow of the hill? "'Can't be our campfire,' the squat man said aloud. I smothered that proper. Them's clouds, pronounced Doble quickly. Clouds and some mist rising from the gulch. I reckon, agreed the other with no sure conviction. Doble must be right, of course. No fire had been in evidence when they left the camping ground, and he was sure he had stamped out the one that had cooked the biscuits. Yet that stringy gray film certainly looked like smoke. He hung in the wind half of a mind to go back and make sure. Fire in the chaparral now would do untold damage. Shorty looked at Doble. If that's fire, Doug. It ain't no chance, snapped the ex-foreman. We'll travel if you don't feel called on to go back and stomp out the mist, Shorty, he added with sarcasm. The cowpuncher took the trail again. Like many men, he was not proof against a sneer. Doug was probably right, Shorty decided, and he did not want to make a fool of himself. Doble would ride him with heavy jeers all day. An hour later they rested their horses on the divide. To the west lay Malapi and the plains. Eastward were the heaven-pricking peaks. 
a long bright line zigzagged across the desert and reflected the sun rays it was the bed of the new road already spiked with shining rails i'm going to town announced dobel shorty looked at him in surprise want to see your picture i reckon it's on a heap of telegraph poles i've been told he said grinning today went on the ex-foreman stubbornly big rawbone guy hooked nose leather face never took no prize as ladies man a wildcat in a rough house and sudden death on the draw extemporized the rustler presumably from his conception of the reward poster i'll lie in the chaparral till night and ride in after dark with the impulsiveness of his kind shorty fell in with the idea he was hungry for the flesh pots of malapi if they dropped in late at night stayed a few hours and kept under cover he could probably slip out of town undetected the recklessness of his nature found an appeal in the danger damn if i don't trail along doug your say so about that like to see my own picture on the poles sawed off little runt straight black hair some bow-legged wears two guns real low don't you monkey with him unless you're hell a mile with a six-shooter one thousand dollars reward for arrest and conviction same for the big guy fellow that gets one of them rewards will earn it said doble grimly goes double agreed shorty he'll earn it even if he don't live to spend it which he's liable not to they headed their horses to the west as they drew down from the mountains they left the trail and took to the brush they wound in and out among the mesquite and the cactus bearing gradually to the north and into the foothills above the town when they reached frio canyon they swung off into a timbered pocket debouching from it here they unsaddled and lay down to wait for night end of chapter thirty three Chapter Thirty Four of Gunsight Pass: How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A pleasant evening. Brad Steelman sat hunched before a fire of pinion knots, head drooped low between his high, narrow shoulders. The restless black eyes in the dark hatchet face were sunk deeper now than in the old days. In them was beginning to come the hunted look of the gray wolf he resembled his nerves were not what they had been and even in his youth they were not of the best he had a way of looking back furtively over his shoulder as though some sinister shadow were creeping toward him out of the darkness three taps on the window brought his head up with a jerk his lax fingers crept to the butt of a colt's revolver he waited listening the taps were repeated steelman sidled to the door and opened it cautiously a man pushed in and closed the door he looked at the sheepman and he laughed shortly in an ugly jeering way scared brad the host moistened his lips what of doug don't ask me said the big man scornfully you always had about as much sand in your craw as a rabbit did you come here to make trouble doug no i came to collect a bill so didn't know i owed you any money right now how much is it steelman as a leader of his gang was used to levies upon his purse when his followers had gone broke he judged that he would have to let doble have about twenty-five dollars now a thousand dollars brad shot a quick sidelong look at him what's wrong now doug the ex-foreman of the d bar lazy r took his time to answer he enjoyed the suspense under which his ally was held why i reckon nothing at all only that this morning I put a match to about a couple of hundred thousand dollars belonging to Crawford, Sanders, and Hart. Eagerly, Steelman clutched his arm. You did it, then. Didn't I say I'd do it? snapped Doble irritably. Do you ever know me to rub back on a bargain? Never. Was more you never will. I fired the chaparral above Bear Canyon. The wind was right. Inside of twenty-four hours the jackpot location will go up in smoke derricks pumps shacks and oil the whole caboodle's doomed sure as i'm a foot high the face of the older man looked more wolfish than ever he rubbed his hands together washing one over the other so that each in turn was massaged hell's bells i'm sure glad to hear it fire got a good start you say i tell you the whole country'll go up like powder 
if steelman had not just reached malapi from a visit to one of his sheep camps he would have known what everybody else in town knew by this time that the range for fifty miles was in danger and that hundreds of volunteers were out fighting the menace his eyes glistened i'll not wear mourning none if it does just that i'm telling you what it'll do doble insisted dogmatically shorty with you he was and he wasn't i did it while he wasn't looking he was saddling his horse in the brush don't make any breaks to him shorty's got a soft spot in him game enough but with queer notions some time i'm liable to have to doble left his sentence suspended in air but steelman looking into his bleak eyes knew what the man meant what's wrong with him now doug well he's been wrong ever since i had to bump off tim harrigan talks about a fair break as if i had a chance to let the old man get to a gun no i'm not so awful sure of shorty better watch him if you see him make any false moves doble watched him with a taunting scornful eye what'll i do the other man's gaze fell why you gotta protect yourself doug ain't you how the narrow shoulders lifted for a moment the small black eyes met those of the big man whatever way seems best to you doug murmured steelman evasively doble slapped his dusty hat against his thigh he laughed without mirth or geniality if you don't beat old nick brad i wonder was you ever out and out straightforward in your life just once i don't reckon you sure enough feel that way doug whined the older man ingratiatingly far as that goes i'm not making any claims that i love my enemies but you can't say i throw off on my friends you always know where i'm at sure i know retorted doble bluntly you're on the inside of a heap of rotten deals so am i but i admit it and you won't well i don't look at it that way but there's no use arguing what about that fire sure it got a good start i looked back from across the valley it was traveling good if the wind don't change it will sure do a lot of damage to the jackpot I'm liable to spoil some of crawford's range too i'll take that thousand in cash brad the big man said letting himself down into the easiest chair he could find and rolling a cigarette soon as i know it did the work doug i'm here telling you it'll make a clean-up we'll know by morning i haven't got the money with me anyhow it's in the bank get it soon as you can i expect to light out again pronto this town's on healthy for me where will you stay asked brad with my friend steelman jeered doble his invitation is so hearty i just can't refuse him you'd be safer somewhere else said the owner of the house after a pause we'll risk that me and you both for if i'm taken it's liable to be bad luck for you too give me something to eat and drink steelman found a bottle of whiskey and a glass then foraged for food in the kitchen he returned with a shank of ham and a loaf of bread his fear was ill disguised the presence of the outlaw if discovered would bring him trouble and doble was so unruly he might out of sheer ennui or bravado let it be known he was there i'll get you the money first thing in the morning promised steelman doble poured himself a large drink and took it at a swallow i would brad no use putting yourself in unnecessary danger or you don't hand me my hat brad i'll go when i'm ready doble drank steadily throughout the night he was the kind of drinker that can take an incredible amount of liquor without becoming helpless he remained steady on his feet growing uglier and more reckless every hour tied to doble because he dared not break away from him steelman's busy brain began to plot a way to take advantage of this man's weakness for liquor he sat across the table from him and adroitly stirred up his hatred of crawford and sanders he raked up every grudge his guest had against the two men calling to his mind how they had beaten him at every turn of course i know doug you're a better man than sanders or crawford either but malapi don't know it yet down at the gusher i hear they laugh about that trick he played on you blowing up the dam luck i call it but laugh do they growled the big man savagely i'd like to hear some of that laughing say this sanders is a wonder that nobody's got a chance against him that's the talk going round 
I said any day in the week you had him beat a mile, and they gave me the laugh. I'll show him, cried the enraged bully with a furious oath. I'll bet you do. No man living can make a fool out of Doug Doble, rustle the evidence to send him to the pen, snap his fingers at him, and on top of that steal his girl. That's what I told. Doble leaned across the table and caught in his great fist the wrist of Steelman. His bloodshot eyes glared into those of the man opposite. What girl? he demanded hoarsely. Steelman looked blandly innocent. Didn't you know, Doug? Maybe I oughtn't to have mentioned it. Fingers like ropes of steel tightened on the wrist. Brad screamed. Don't do that, Doug. You're killing me. Ouch! M. Crawford's girl. What about her and Sanders? Why, he's courting her, treating her to ice cream, going walking with her. Didn't you know? When did he begin? Doble slammed a ham-like fist on the table. Spit it out, or I'll tear your arm off. Steelman told all he knew, and a good deal more. He invented details calculated to infuriate his confederate, to inflame his jealousy. The big man sat with jaw clamped, the muscles knotted like ropes on his leathery face. He was a volcano of outraged vanity and furious hate, seething with fires ready to erupt. Some folks say it's hard she's engaged to, purred the hatchet faced tempter. Maybe so. Looks to me like she's throwing down heart for this convict. Expect she sees he's gonna be a big man some day. Big man? Who says so? exploded Doble. That's the word, Doug. I reckon you've heard how the governor of Colorado pardoned him. This town's crazy about Sanders. Claims he was famed for the penitentiary. Right now he could be elected to any office he went after. Steelman's restless black eyes watched furtively the effect of his taunting on this man, a victim of wild and uncurbed passions. He was egging him on to a rage that would throw away all caution and all scruples. He'll never live to run for office, the cattleman cried hoarsely. They talk him for sheriff. Say Applegate's no good, too easy going. Say Sanders will round up you and Shorty pronto when he's given authority. Doble ripped out a wild and explosive oath. He knew this man was playing on his vanity, jealousy, and hatred for some purpose not yet apparent, but he found it impossible to close his mind to the whisperings of the plotter. He welcomed the spur of Steelman's two-edged tongue, because he wanted to have his purpose of vengeance fed. Sanders never saw the day he could take me dead or alive. I'll meet him any time, any way, and when I turn my back on him, he'll be ready for the coroner. I believe you, Doug. No need to tell me you're not afraid of him, for— Afraid of him? bellowed Doble, eyes like live coals. Say that again and I'll twist your head off. Steelman did not say it again. He pushed the bottle toward his guests and said other things. End of chapter 34「Chapter thirty five of Gunside Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fire in the Chaparral. A carpenter working on the roof of a derrick for jackpot number six called down to his mates, Fire in the hills, looks like. I see smoke. The contractor was an old timer. He knew the danger of fire in the chaparral at this season of the year. Run over to number four and tell Crawford, he said to his small son. Crawford and Hart had just driven out from town. I'll shag up the tower and have a look, the younger man said. He had with him no field glasses, but his eyes were trained to long-distance work. Years in the saddle on the range had made him an expert at reading such news as the landscape had written on it. Fire in the canyon, he shouted down. Quite a bit of smoke rising. I'll ride right up and look it over, the cattleman called back. Better get a gang together to fight it, Bob. Hike up as soon as you're ready. Crawford borrowed, without permission of the owner, the nearest saddle horse and put it to a lope. Five minutes might make all the difference between a winning and a losing fight. From the tower, Hart descended swiftly. He gathered together all the carpenters, drillers, engine men, and tool dressers in the vicinity and equipped them with shovels, picks, brush hooks, saws, and axes. To each one he gave also a gunny sack. The foot party followed Crawford into the chaparral, making for the hills that led to Bear Canyon. 
a wind was stirring and as they topped a rise it struck hot on their cheeks a flake of ash fell on bob's hand crawford met them at the mouth of the canyon she's rip rarin', bob got too big a start to beat out we'll clear a fire break where the gulch narrows just above here and do our fightin' there the sparks of a thousand rockets flung high by the wind were swept down the gulch toward them behind these came a curtain of black smoke the cattleman set his crew to work clearing a wide trail across the gorge from wall to wall the undergrowth was heavy and the men attacked with brush hooks shovels and axes one man with a wet gunny sack was detailed to see that no flying spark started a new blaze below the safety zone the shovelers and grubbers cleared the grass and roots off to the dirt for a belt of twenty feet they banked the loose dirt at the lower edge to catch flying firebrands meanwhile the breath of the furnace grew to a steady heat on their faces flame spurts had leaped forward to a grove of small alders and almost in a minute the branches were crackling like fireworks i'll scout around over the hill and have a look above bob said we've got to keep it from spreading out of the gulch take the horse crawford called to him one good thing was that the fire was coming down the canyon a downhill blaze moves less rapidly than one running up runners of flame crawling like snakes among the brush struck out at the fighters venomously and tried to leap the trench the defenders flailed at these with wet gunny sacks the wind was stiffer now and the fury of the fire closer the flames roared down the canyon like a blast furnace driven back by the intense heat the men retreated across the break and clung to their line already their lungs were sore from inhaling smoke and their throats were inflamed a pine its pitchy trunk ablaze crashed down across the fire trail and caught in the fork of a tree beyond instantly the foliage leaped to red flame crawford axe in hand began to chop the trunk and a big swede swung an axe powerfully on the opposite side the rest of the crew continued to beat down the fires that started below the break the chips flew at each rhythmic stroke of the keen blades presently the tree crashed down into the trail that had been hewn it served as a conductor and along it tongues of fire leaped into the brush beyond glowing branches flung by the wind and hurled from falling timber buried themselves in the dry undergrowth before one blaze was crushed half a dozen others started in its place flails and gunny sacks beat those down and smothered them bob galloped into the canyon and flung himself from the horse as he pulled it up in his stride she's jumping out of the gulch above too late to head her off we better get scrapers up and run a trail along the top of the ridge don't you reckon he said yes son agreed crawford we can just about hold her there it'll be hours before i can spare a man for the ridge we got to get help in a hurry you ride to town and rustle men bring out plenty of dynamite and gunny sacks lucky we got the tools out here we brought to build the sump holes bet ya we'll need lots of grub too the cattleman nodded agreement and coffee can't have too much coffee it's food and drink and helps keep the men awake i'll remember and for the love of heaven don't forget canteens get every canteen in town can't have my men running around with their tongues hanging out better bring out a bunch of bronx to pack supplies around it's gonna be one man size contract running the commissary the canyon above them was by this time a sea of fire the most terrifying sight bob had ever looked upon monster flames leaped at the walls of the gulch swept in an eye beat over draws attacked with a savage roar of the dry vegetation the noise was like the crash of mountains meeting thunder could scarce have made itself heard rocks loosened by the heat tore down the steep incline of the walls sometimes singly sometimes in slides these hit the bed of the ravine with the force of a cannonball the workers had to keep a sharp lookout for these a man near bob was standing with his weight on the shovel he had been using hart gave a shout of warning at the same moment a large rock struck the handle and snapped it off as though it had been kindling wood the man wrung his hands and almost wept with the pain a cottontail ran squealing past them driven from its home by this new and deadly enemy not far away a rattlesnake slid across the hot rocks their common fear of man was lost in a greater and more immediate one hart did not like to leave the battlefield 
Let me stay here. You can handle that end of the job better than me, Mr. Crawford. The old cattleman, his face streaked with black, looked at him from bloodshot eyes. Where do you get that notion I'll quit a job I've started, son? You hit the trail. The sooner the quicker. The young man wasted no more words. He swung to the saddle and rode for town, faster than he had ever traveled in all his hard-riding days. End of chapter 35《Chapter Thirty Six of Gunsight Pass — How Oil Came Through the Cattle Country and Brought a New West — by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fighting Fire Sanders was in the office of the Jackpot Company looking over some blueprints when Joyce Crawford came in and inquired where her father was. He went out with Bob Hart to the oil field this morning, some trouble with the casing. Thought Dad wasn't giving any of his time to oil these days, she said. He told me you and Bob were running the company. Well, every once in a while he takes an interest. I prod him up to go out and look things over occasionally. He's president of the company, and I tell him he ought to know what's going on. So today he's out there. Oh, Miss Joyce, having learned what she had come in to find out, might reasonably have departed. She declined a chair. She said she must be going, yet she did not go. Her eyes appeared to study without seeing a field map on the desk. Dad told me something last night, Mr. Sanders. He said I might pass it on to you and Bob, though it isn't to go farther. It's about that ten thousand dollars he paid the bank when it called his loan. He got the money from Buck Byington. Buck! exclaimed the young man. He was thinking that the Buck he used to know never had ten dollars saved, let alone ten thousand. I know, she explained. That's it. The money wasn't his. He's executor or something for the children of his dead brother. This money had come in from the sale of a farm back in Iowa, and he was waiting for an order of the court for permission to invest it in a mortgage. When he heard Dad was so desperately hard up for cash, he let him have the money. He knew Dad would pay it back, but it seems what he did was against the law, even though Dad gave him his note and a chattel mortgage on some cattle which Buck wasn't to record. Now it has been straightened out. That's why Dad couldn't tell where he got the money. Buck would have been in trouble. I see. But now it's all right, Joyce continued the subject. There were teasing pinpoints of mischief in her eyes. My school physiology used to say that sleep was restful. It builds up worn-out tissue and all. One of these nights, when you can find time, give it a trial and see whether that's true. Dave laughed. The mother in this young woman would persistently out. I get plenty of sleep, Miss Joyce. Most people sleep too much. How much do you sleep? Sometimes more, sometimes less. I average six or seven hours, maybe. Maybe, she scoffed. Hard work doesn't hurt men, not when they're young and strong. I hear you're trying to work yourself to death, sir, the girl charged, smiling. Not so bad as that. He answered her smile with another, for no reason except that the world was a sunshiny one when he looked at this trim and dainty young woman. The work gets fascinating. A fellow likes to get things done. There's a satisfaction in turning out a full day and in feeling you get results. She nodded sagely in a brisk, businesslike way. I know. Felt it myself, often. But we have to remember that there are other days and other people to lend a hand. None of us can do it all. Dad thinks you overdo. So he told me to ask you to supper for tomorrow night. Bob will be there, too. Say thanks, Miss Joyce, to your father and his daughter. Which means you'll be with us tomorrow? I'll be with you. But he was not. Even as he made the promise, a shadow darkened the door sill, and Bob Hart stepped into the office. His first words were ominous, but before he spoke, both of those looking at him knew he was the bearer of bad news. There was in his boyish face an unwanted gravity. Fire in the chaparral, Dave, and going strong. Sanders spoke one word. Where? Started in Bear Canyon, but it's jumped out into the hills. The wind must be driving it down toward the jackpot. Yep, like a scared rabbit. 
Crawford's trying to hold the mouth of the canyon. He's got a man's job down there. Can't spare a soul to keep it from scooting over the hills. Dave rose. I'll gather a bunch of men and ride right out. On what side of the canyon is the fire running? East side. Stop at the wells and get tools. I gotta rustle dynamite and men. Be out soon as I can. They spoke quietly, quickly, decisively, as men of action do in a crisis. Joyce guessed the situation was a desperate one. Is Dad in danger? she asked. Hart answered, No, not now, anyhow. What can I do to help? We'll have hundreds of men in the field, probably, if this fire has a real start, Dave told her. We'll need food and coffee, lots of it. Organize the women, make meat sandwiches, hundreds of them, and send out to the jackpot dozens of coffee pots. Your job is to keep the workers well fed. Better send out bandages and salve in case some get burnt. Her eyes were shining. I'll see to all that. Don't worry, boys. You fight this fire and we women will tend to feeding you. Dave nodded and strode out of the room. During the fierce and dreadful days that followed, one memory more than once came to him in the fury of the battle. It was a slim, straight girl looking at him, the call to service stamped on her brave, uplifted face. Sanders was on the road inside of twenty minutes, a group of horsemen galloping at his heels. At the jackpot locations, the firefighters equipped themselves with shovels, sacks, axes, and brush hooks. The party, still on horseback, rode up to the mouth of Bear Canyon. Through the smoke, the sun was blood red. The air was heavy and heated. From the fire line, Crawford came to meet these new allies. We're holding her here. It's been nip and tuck. Once I thought sure she'd break through, but we beat out the blaze. I hadn't time to go look, but I expect she's just a rarin' over the hills. I've had some teams and scrapers taken up there, Dave. It's your job. Go to it. The old cattleman showed that he had been through a fight. His eyes were red and inflamed, his face streaked with black, one arm of his shirt half torn from the shoulder. But he wore the grim look of a man who has just begun to set himself for a struggle. The horseman swung to the east and rode up to the mesa which lies between Bear and Cattle Canyons. It was impossible to get near Bear, since the imprisoned fury had burst from its walls and was sweeping the chaparral. The line of fire was running along the level in irregular ragged front, red tongues leaping ahead with short furious rushes. Even before he could spend time to determine the extent of the fire, Dave selected his line of defense, a ridge of rocky higher ground cutting across from one gulch to the other. Here he set teams to work, scraping a fire break, while men assisted with shovels and brush hooks to clear a wide path. Dave swung still farther east and rode along the edge of Cattle Canyon. Narrow and rock-lined, the gorge was like a boiler flue to suck the flames down it. From where he sat, he saw it caging with inconceivable fury. The earth rift seemed to be roofed with flame. Great billows of black smoke poured out laden with sparks and live coals carried by the wind. It was plain at the first glance that the fire was bound to leap from the canyon to the brush-covered hills beyond. His business now was to hold the ridge he had chosen and fight back the flames to keep them from pouring down upon the jackpot property. Later, the battle would have to be fought to hold the line at San Jacinto Canyon and the hills running down from it to the plains. The surface fire on the hills licked up the brush, mesquite, and young cedars with amazing rapidity. If his trail break was built in time, Dave meant to backfire above it. Steve Russell was one of his party. Sanders appointed him lieutenant and went over the ground with him to decide exactly where the clearing should run, after which he galloped back to the mouth of Bear. She's running wild on the hills and in Cattle Canyon, Dave told Crawford. She'll sure jump cattle and reach San Jacinto. We've got to hold the mouth of cattle. Build a trail between Bear and Cattle, another between Cattle and San Jacinto. Cork her up in San Jacinto and keep her from jumping to the hills beyond. Can we backfire, do you reckon? Not with the wind there is above, unless we have check trails built first. We need several hundred more men, and we need them right away. I never saw such a fire before. Well, get your trail built. Bob ought to be out soon. I'll put him over between Cattle and San Jacinto. Three, four men can hold her here now. I'll move my outfit over to the mouth of cattle. 
the cattleman spoke crisply and decisively he had been fighting fire for six hours without a moment's rest swallowing smoke-filled air enduring the blistering heat that poured steadily at them down the gorge at least two of his men were lying down completely exhausted but he contemplated another such desperate battle without turning a hair all his days he had been a good fighter and it never occurred to him to quit now sanders rode up as close to the west edge of bear canyon as he could endure in two or three places the flames had jumped the wall and were trying to make headway in the scant underbrush of the rocky slope that led to a hogback surmounted by a bare rim rock running to the summit this natural barrier would block the fire on the west just as the burn-over area would protect the north for the present at least the firefighters could confine their efforts to the south and east where the spread of the blaze would involve the jackpot a shift in the wind would change the situation and if it came in time would probably save the oil property dave put his horse to a lope and rode back to the trench and trail his men were building he found a shovel and joined them from out of cattle canyon bills of smoke rolled across the hill and settled into a black blanket above the men this was acrid from the resinous pitch of the pines the wind caught the dark pall drove it low and held it there till the workers could hardly breathe the sun was under entire eclipse behind the smoke screen the heat of the flames tortured dave's face and hands just as the smoke filled air inflamed his nostrils and throat coals of fire pelted him from river of flame carried by the strong breeze blowing down from the canyons on either side of the workers came a steady roar of world of fire occasionally at some slight shift of the wind the smoke lifted and they could see the moving wall of the fire bearing down upon them wedges of it far ahead of the main line the movements of the workers became automatic the teams had to be removed because the horses had become unmanageable under the torture of the heat when any one spoke it was in a hoarse whisper because of a swollen larynx mechanically they dug shoveled grubbed handkerchiefs over their faces to protect from the furnace glow a deer with two fawns emerged from the smoke and flew past on the way to safety mice snakes rabbits birds and other desert denizens appeared in mad flight they paid no attention whatever to their natural foe man the terror of the red monster at their heels wholly obsessed them the firebreak was from fifteen to twenty feet wide the men retreated back of it driven by the heat and fought with wet sacks to hold the enemy a flash of lightning was hurled against dave it was a red-hot limb of pine tossed out of the gorge by the stiff wind he flung it from him and tore the burning shirt from his chest an agony of pain shot through his shoulder seared for half a foot by the blazing branch he had no time to attend to the burn then the fire had leaped the check trail at a dozen points with his men he tried to smother the flames in the grass by using saddle blankets and gunny sacks as well as by shoveling sand upon it sometimes they cut down the smoldering brush and flung it back across the break into the inferno on the other side blinded and strangling from the smoke the firefighters would make short rushes into the clearer air swallow a breath or two of it and plunge once more into the line to do battle with the foe for hours the desperate battle went on dave lost count of time one after another of his men retreated to rest after a time they drifted back to help make the defense good against the plunging fire devil sanders alone refused to retire his parched eyebrows were half gone his clothes hung about him in shredded rags he was so exhausted that he could hardly wield a flail his legs dragged and his arms hung heavy but he would not give up even for an hour through the confused shifting darkness of the night he led his band silhouetted on the ridge like gnomes of the netherworld to attack after attack on the tireless creeping plunging flames that leaped the trench in a hundred desperate assaults that howled and hissed and roared like ravenous beasts of prey before the light of day broke he knew that he had won his men had made good the check trail that held back the fire in the terrain between bear and cattle canyons the fire worn out and beaten fell back for lack of fuel upon which to feed reinforcements came from town dave left the trail in charge of a deputy and staggered down with his men to the camp that had been improvised below 
He sat down with them and swallowed coffee and ate sandwiches. Steve Russell dressed as burn with salve and bandages sent out by Joyce. Me for the hay, Dave, the cowpuncher said when he had finished. He stretched himself in a long, tired, luxurious lawn. I've rid out a blizzard and I've gathered cattle after a stampede till most thought I'd drop out of the saddle. But I give it to this here little fire. It's sure enough a stem winder. I'm beat. So long, partner. Russell went off to roll himself up in his blanket. Dave envied him, but he could not do the same. His responsibilities were not ended yet. He found his horse in the Bermuda, saddled, and rode over to the entrance to Cattle Canyon. Emerson Crawford was holding his ground, though barely holding it. He, too, was grimy, fire-black, and exhausted, but he was still fighting to throw back the fire that swept down the canyon at him. "'How are things up above?' he asked in a hoarse whisper. "'Good. We held the check line. Same here so far. It's been hell. Several of my boys fainted.' "'I'll take charge a while. You go and get some sleep,' urged Sanders. The cattleman shook his head. "'No, see it through. Say, son, look who's here.' His thumb hitched toward his right shoulder. Dave looked down the line of black and grimy firefighters, and his eye fell on Shorty. He was still wearing chaps, but his chihuahua hat had succumbed long ago. Manifestly, the man had been on the fighting line for some hours.' doesn't he know about the reward yes he was hiding in malapi when the call came for men says he's no quitter whatever else he is you bet he ain't he's worked two most men at this work soon as we get through he'll be on the dodge again i reckon unless applegate gets him first he's a good sport anyhow i'll say that for him i reckon i'm a bad citizen sir but i hope he makes his getaway before applegate shows up well He's one tough scalawag, but I don't aim to give him away right now. Shorty's a whole lot better proposition than Doug Doble. Dave came back to the order of the day. What do you want me to do now? The cattleman looked him over. You damaged much? No. Burton the shoulder, I see. Won't keep me from swinging a sack and bossing a gang. Wore out, I reckon. I feel fine since breakfast. Two cups of strong coffee. Again Crawford's eyes traveled over his ally. They saw a ragged, red-eyed tramp, face and hands and arms blackened with char and grimed with smoke. Outside he was such a specimen of humanity as the police would have arrested promptly on suspicion. But the shrewd eyes of the cattleman saw more, a spirit indomitable that would drive the weary, tormented body till it dropped in its tracks, a quality of leadership that was a trumpet call to the men who served with him, a sole master of its infirmities. His heart went out to the young fellow, wherefore he grinned and gave him another job. Strong men today were at a premium with Emerson Crawford. Right over to see how Bob's coming out. We'll make it here. Sanders swung to the saddle and moved forward to the next fire front, the one between Cattle and San Jacinto Canyons. Hart himself was not there. There had come a call for help from the man in charge of the gang trying to hold the fire in San Jacinto. He had answered that summons long before daybreak and had not yet returned. The situation on the cattle San Jacinto front was not encouraging. The distance to be protected was nearly a mile. Part of the way was along a ridge fairly easy to defend, but a good deal of it lay in lower land of timber and heavy brush. Dave rode along the front, studying the contour of the country and the chance of defending it. His judgment was that it could not be done with the men on hand. He was not sure that the line could be held even with reinforcements. But there was nothing for it but to try. He sent a man to Crawford, urging him to get help to him as soon as possible. Then he took command of the crew already in the field, rearranged the men so as to put the larger part of his force on the most dangerous locality, and in default of a sack, seized a spreading branch as a flail to beat out fire in the high grass close to San Jacinto. An hour later, half a dozen straggling men reported for duty. Shorty was one of them. "'The old man can't spare any more,' the rustler explained. "'He had to hustle Steve and his gang out of their blankets to go help Bob Hart. They say Hart's in a hell of a bad way. The fire's jumped the trail check and is spreading over the country. He's running another trail farther back.' 
it occurred to dave that if the wind changed suddenly and heightened it would sweep a backfire around him and cut off the retreat of his crew he sent a weary lad back to keep watch on it and report any change of direction in that vicinity after which he forgot all about chance's danger from the rear his hands and mind were more than busy trying to drive back the snarling ravenous beasts in front of him he might have found time to take other precautions if he had known that the exhausted boy sent to watch against a backfire had with the coming of night fallen asleep in a draw End of chapter thirty six Chapter thirty seven of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Shorty asks a question. When Shorty separated from Doble in Frio Canyon, he rode inconspicuously to a tendejon where he could be snugly hidden from the public gaze and yet meet a few pals whom he could trust, at least as long as he could keep his eyes on them his intention was to have a good time in the only way he knew how another purpose was coupled with this he was not going to drink enough to interfere with reasonable caution shorty's dissipated pleasures were interfered with shortly after midnight a mexican came into the drinking place with news the world was on fire at least that part of it which interested the cattlemen of the Malapi district the blaze had started back of Bear Canyon and had been swept by the wind across to cattle in San Jacinto. The oil field adjacent had been licked up, and every reservoir and sump was in flames. The whole range would probably be wiped out before the fire spent itself for lack of fuel. Crawford had posted a rider to town calling for more manpower to build trails and wield flails. This was the sum of the news. It was not strictly accurate but it served to rouse shorty at once he rose and touched the mexican on the arm where'd you say that fire started pedro bear canyon senor and it crossed san jacinto like wildfire the slim vaquero made a gesture all-inclusive it runs senor like a frightened jackrabbit nothing will stop it nothing it is sent by heaven for a punishment hm shorty grunted the rustler fell into a somber silence. He drank no more. The dark-lashed eyes of the Mexican girl slanted his way in vain. He stared sullenly at the table in front of him. A problem had pushed itself into his consciousness, one he could not brush aside or ignore. If the fire had started back of Bear Canyon, what agency had set it going? He and Doble had camped last night at that very spot. If there had been a fire there during the night, he must have known it. Then when had the fire started, and how? They had seen the faint smoke of it as they rode away, the filmy smoke of a young fire not yet under much headway. Was it reasonable to suppose that someone else had been camping close to them? This was possible, but not likely, for they would probably have seen signs of the other evening campfire eliminating this possibility there remained doug doble had doug fired the brush while his companion was saddling for the start the more shorty considered this possibility the greater force it acquired in his mind doug's hatred of crawford hart and especially sanders would be satiated in part at least if he could wipe their oil bonanza from the map the wind had been right doble was no fool he knew that if the fire ran wild in the chaparral only a miracle could save the jackpot reservoirs and plant from destruction other evidence accumulated cryptic remarks of doble made during the day his anxiety to see steelman immediately a certain manner of ill-repressed triumph whenever he mentioned sanders or crawford these bolstered Shorty's growing opinion that the man had deliberately fired the chaparral from a spirit of revenge. Shorty was an outlaw and a bad man. He had killed and might at any time kill again. To save the jackpot from destruction, he would not have made a turn of the hand. But Shorty was a cattleman. He had been brought up in the saddle and had known the whine of the lariat and the dust of the drag drive all his days. Every man has his code three things stood out in that of shorty 
he was loyal to the hand that paid him he stood by his pals and he believed in and after his own fashion loved cattle and the life of which they were the central fact to destroy the range feed wantonly was a crime so nefarious that he could not believe doble guilty of it and yet he could not let the matter lie in doubt he left the tender home and rode to steelman's house before entering he examined carefully both of his long-barreled forty-fives he made sure that the six-shooters were in perfect order and that they rested free in the holsters that six cents acquired by bad men by means of which they sniffed danger when it is close was telling him that smoke would rise before he left the house he stepped to the porch and knocked there came a moment's silence a low-pitched murmur of whispering voices carried through an open window the shuffling of feet the door was opened by brad steelman he was alone in the room where's doug asked shorty bluntly why doug why he's here shorty didn't know it was you loud it might be someone else so he stepped into another room the short cowpuncher walked in and closed the door behind him he stood with his back to it facing the other door of the room did you hire doug to fire the chaparral he asked his voice ominously quiet a flicker of fear shot to the eyes of the oil promoter he recognized signs of peril and his heart was drenched with an icy chill shorty was going to turn on him had become a menace i i don't know what you mean he quavered i'll call doug if you want to see him he began to shuffle toward the inner room hold your horses brad i ask you a question the cold eyes of the gunman bored into those of the other man how come you to hire doug to burn the range you know i wouldn't do that the older man whined i got sheep ain't i wouldn't be reasonable i'd destroy their feed no you got a wrong notion about your sheep ain't on the south slope range shorty's mind had moved forward one notch towards certainty steelman's manner was that of a man dodging the issue it carried no conviction of innocence how much you payin them the door of the inner room opened doug doble's big frame filled the entrance the eyes of the two gunmen searched each other those of doble asked a question had it come to a showdown steelman sidled over to the desk where he worked and sat down in front of it his right hand dropped into an open drawer apparently carelessly and without intent shorty knew at once that doble had been drinking heavily the man was morose and sullen his color was high plainly he was primed for a killing if trouble came looking for me shorty he asked you fired bear canyon charged the cowpuncher so when i went to saddle doble's eyes narrowed you aiming to run my business shorty neither man lifted his gaze from the other each knew that the test had come once more they were both men who had gone bad in the current phrase of the community both had killed both searched now for an advantage in that steady duel of the eyes neither had any fear the emotions that dominated were cold rage and caution every sense and nerve in each focalized to one purpose to kill without being killed when yours is mine doug is this yours sure is i've stood for a heap from you i've let your ugly temper ride me when you killed tim harrigan you got me in bad not the first time either but i'm damned if i'll ride with a coyote low down enough to burn the range no no from the desk came the sharp angry bark of a revolver shorty felt his hat lift as a bullet tore through the rim his eyes swept to steelman who had been a negligible factor in his calculations the man fired again and blew out the light in the darkness shorty swept out both guns and fired his first two shots were directed toward the man behind the desk the next two at the spot where doble had been standing another gun was booming in the room perhaps two yellow fire flashes ripped the blackness shorty whipped open the door at his back slid through it and kicked it shut with his foot as he leaped from the porch at the same moment he thought he heard a groan swiftly he ran to the cottonwood where he had left his horse tied he jerked loose the knot swung to the saddle and galloped out of town 
the drumming of hoofs came down the wind to a young fellow returning from a late call on his sweetheart he wondered who was in such a hurry end of chapter thirty seven Chapter Thirty Eight of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Doug Doble Rides into the Hills. The booming of the guns died down. The acrid smoke that filled the room lifted to shredded strata. A man's deep breathing was the only sound in the heavy darkness. Presently came a soft footfall of someone moving cautiously. A match flared. A hand cupped the flame for an instant to steady it before the match moved toward the wick of a kerosene lamp. Doug Doble's first thought was for his own safety. The house door was closed. The window blinds were down. He had heard the beat of hoofs die away on the road, but he did not intend to be caught by a trick. He stepped forward, locked the door, and made sure the blinds were offering no cracks of light. Satisfied that all was well, he turned to the figure sprawled on the floor with outflung arms. "'Dez a duck show, he said callously after he had turned the body over. "'Got him plumb through the forehead. In the dark, too. Some shooting, Shorty.' He stood looking down at the face of the man whose brain had spun so many cobwebs of deceit and treachery. Even in death it had none of that dignity which sometimes is lent to those whose lives have been full of meanness and guile. But though Doble looked at his late ally, he was not thinking about him. He was mapping out his future course of action. If any one had heard the shots and were found here now, no jury on earth could be convinced that he had not killed Steelman. His six-shooter still gave forth a faint trickle of smoke. An examination would show that three shots had been fired from it. He must get away from the place at once. Doble poured himself half a tumbler of whiskey and drank it neat. Yes, he must go, but he might as well take with him any money Steelman had in the safe. The dead man owed him a thousand dollars he would never be able to collect in any other way. He stooped and examined the pockets of the still figure. A bunch of keys rewarded him. An old-fashioned safe stood in the corner back of the desk. Doble stooped in front of it, then waited for an instant to make sure nobody was coming. He fell to work, trying the keys one after another. A key fitted. He turned it and swung open the door. The killer drew out bundles of papers and glanced through them hurriedly. Deeds, mortgages, oil stocks, old receipts. He wanted none of these and tossed them to the floor as soon as he discovered there were no banknotes among them. Compartment after compartment he rifled. Behind a package of abstracts, he found a bunch of greenbacks tied together by a rubber band at each end. The first bill showed that the denomination was fifty dollars. Doble investigated no farther. He thrust the bulky package into his inside coat pocket and rose. Again he listened. No sound broke the stillness of the night. The silence got on his nerves. He took another big drink and decided it was time to go. He blew out the light and once more listened. The lifeless body of his ally lying within touch of his foot did not disturb the outlaw. He had not killed him, and if he had, it would have made no difference. Very softly for a large man, he passed to the inner room and toward the back door. He deflected his course to a cupboard where he knew Steelman kept liquor, and from a shelf helped himself to an unbroken quart bottle of bourbon. He knew himself well enough to know that during the next twenty-four hours he would want whiskey badly. Slowly he unlocked and opened the back door. His eyes searched the yard and the open beyond to make sure that neither his enemy nor a sheriff's posse was lurking in the brush for him. He crept out to the stable, revolver in hand. Here he saddled in the dark, deftly and rapidly, thrusting the bottle of whiskey into one of the pockets of the saddlebags. Leading the horse out into the mesquite, he swung to the saddle and rode away. He was still in the saddle when the peaks above caught the morning sun-glow in a shaft of golden light. Far up in the gulches the new-fallen snow reflected the dawn's pink. In a pocket of the hills, Doble unsaddled. He hobbled his horse and turned it loose to graze while he lay down under a pine with the bottle for a companion. The man had always had a difficult temper. 
this had grown on him and been responsible largely for his decline in life it had been no part of his plan to go bad there had been a time when he had been headed for success in the community he had held men's respect even though they had not liked him then somehow he had turned the wrong corner and been unable to retrace his steps he could even put a finger on the time he had commenced to slip it had begun when he had quarrelled with emerson crawford about his daughter joyce shorty and he had done some brand burning through a wet blanket but he had not gone so far that a return to respectability was impossible a little rustling on the quiet with no evidence to fasten it to one was nothing to bar a man from society he had gone more definitely wrong after sanders came back to malapi the young ex-convict he chose to think was responsible for the circumstances that made of him an outlaw crawford and sanders together had exposed him and driven him from the haunts of men to the hills he hated them both with a bitter morose virulence his soul could not escape throughout the day he continued to drink this gave him no refuge from himself he still brooded in the inferno of his own thought circle it is possible that a touch of madness had begun to affect his brain certainly his subsequent actions would seem to bear out this theory revenge the thought of it spurred him every waking hour rallying his wounded pride cruelly there was a way within reach of his hand one suggested by steelman's whisperings though never openly advocated by the sheepman the jealousy of the man urged him to it and his consuming vanity persuaded him that out of evil might come good he could make the girl love him so her punishment would bring her joy in the end as for crawford and sanders his success would be such bitter medicine to them that time would never wear away the taste of it at dusk he rose and resaddled under the stars he rode back to malapi he knew exactly what he meant to do and how he meant to do it end of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of gunside pass how oil came to the cattle country and brought a new west by william mcleod rain this librivox recording is in the public domain the tunnel dave knew no rest that night he patrolled his line from san jacinto to cattle and back again stopping always to lend a hand where the attack was most furious the men of the crew were weary to exhaustion but the pressure of the fire was so great that they dared not leave the front as soon as one blaze was beaten out another started a shower of sparks close to cattle canyon swept over the ridge and set the thick grass afire this was smothered with saddle blankets and with sand and dirt thrown from shovels near to san jacinto canyon the danger was more acute dave did not dare backfire on account of the wind he dynamited the timber to make a trail break against the howling roaring wall of fire plunging forward as soon as the flames seized the timber the heat grew more intense the sound of fallen trees as they crashed down marked the progress of the fire the men retreated staggering with exhaustion hands and faces flayed eyes inflamed and blinded by the black smoke that rolled over them a stiff wind was blowing but it was no longer a steady one sometimes it bore from the northeast again in a cross current almost directly from the east the smoke poured in swirling around them till they scarce knew one direction from another the dense cloud lifted for a moment swept away by an air current to the firefighters that glimpse of the landscape told an appalling fact the demon had escaped below from san jacinto canyon and been swept westward by a slant of wind with the speed of an express train they were trapped by the back fire in a labyrinth from which there appeared no escape every path of exit was blocked the flames had leaped from hilltop to hilltop the men gathered together to consult many of them were on the verge of panic dave spoke quietly we've got a chance if we keep our heads there's an old mining tunnel hereabouts follow me and stay together he plunged into the heavy smoke that had fallen about them again working his way by instinct rather than by sight 
twice he stopped to make sure that his men were all at heel several times he left them diving into the smoke to determine which way they must go the dry salt crackle of a dead pine close at hand would have told him even if the oppressive heat had not that the fire would presently sweep over the ground where they stood he drew the men steadily toward cattle canyon in that furious murk-filled world he could not be sure he was moving in the right direction though the slope of the ground led him to think so fallen trees crashed about them the men staggered on in the uncanny light which tinged even the smoke dave stopped and gave sharp crisp orders his voice was even and steady must be close to it now lie back of these down trees with your faces close to the ground i'll be back in a minute shorty you're boss of the crew while i'm away you're gonna leave us to roast a man accused in a voice that was half a scream sanders did not stop to answer him but shorty took the hysterical man in hand get down by that log pronto or i'll bore a hole in you and you got sense enough to see he'll save us if there's a chance the man fell trembling to the ground Two men behind each log, ordered Shorty. If your clothes get a fire, help each other put it out. They lay down and waited while the fire swept above and around them. Fortunately, the woods here were not dense. Men prayed or cursed or wept according to their natures. The logs in front of some of them caught fire and spread to their clothing. Shorty's voice encouraged them. Stick it out, boys. He'll be back if he's alive it could have been only minutes but it seemed hours before the voice of sanders rang out above the fury of the blast all up i found the tunnel step lively now they staggered after their leader shorty bringing up the rear to see that none collapsed by the way the line moved drunkenly forward now and again a man went down overcome by the smoke and heat with brutal kicks shorty drove him to his feet again the tunnel was a shallow one in a hillside dave stood aside and counted the men as they passed in two were missing he ran along the back trail dense with smoke from the approaching flames and stumbled into a man it was shorty he was dragging with him the body of a man who had fainted sanders seized an arm and together they managed to get the unconscious victim to the tunnel dave was the last man in he learned from the men in the rear that the tunnel had no drift the floor was moist and there was a small seepage spring in it near the entrance some of the men protested at staying the fire will lick in and burn us out like rats one man urged this ain't no protection we just walked into a trap i'll take my chance outside dave reached forward and lifted one of shorty's guns from its holster you'll stay right here dillon we didn't make it one minute too soon the whole hill out there is roaring i'll take my chance out there that's my lookout said the man moving toward the entrance no you'll stay here dave's hard chill gaze swept over his crew several of them were backing dillon and others were wavering it's your only chance and i'm here to see you take it don't take another step dillon took one and went crumpling to the granite floor before dave could move shorty had knocked him down with the butt of his nine-inch barreled revolver already smoke was filling the cave the fire had raced to its mouth and was licking in with long red hungry tongues the tunnel timbers were smoldering lie down and breathe the air close to the ground ordered dave just as though a mutiny had not been quelled a moment before stay down there don't get up he found an old tomato can and used it to throw water from the seep spring upon the burning wood shorty and one or two of the other men helped him the heat near the mouth was so intense they could not stand it all but sanders collapsed and staggered back to sink down to the fresher air below their place of refuge packed with smoke a tree crashed down at the mouth and presently a second one these blazing sent more heat in to cook the tortured men inside in that bakehouse of hell men showed again their nature cursing praying storming or weeping as they lay the prospect hole became a madhouse a big hungarian crazed by the torment he was enduring leaped to his feet and made for the blazing hill outside back there dave shouted hoarsely the big fellow rushed him his leader flung him back against the rock wall 
he rushed again screaming in crazed anger sanders struck him down with the long barrel of the forty five the hungarian lay where he fell for a few minutes then crawled back from the mouth of the pit at intervals others tried to break out and were driven back dave's eyebrows crisped away he could scarcely draw a breath through his inflamed throat his eyes were swollen and almost blinded with smoke his lungs ached whenever he took a step he staggered but he stuck to his job heartily the tomato can moved more jerkily it carried less water but it still continued to drench the blazing timbers at the mouth of the tunnel so dave held the tunnel entrance against the fire and against his own racked and tortured men occasionally he lay down to breathe the air close to the floor there was no circulation for the tunnel ended in a wall face but the smoke was not so heavy close to the ground man after man succumbed to the stupor of unconsciousness men choked strangled and even died while their leader his hair burnt and his eyes almost sightless face and body raw with agonizing wounds crept feebly about his business of saving their lives fire crisped and exhausted he dropped down at last into forgetfulness of pain and the flames which had fought with such savage fury to blot out the little group of men fell back sullenly in defeat they had spent themselves and could do no more the line of fire had passed over them it left charred trees still burning a hillside black and smoking desolation and ruin in its path out of the prospect hole a man crawled over dave's prostrate body he drew a breath of sweet delicious air a cool wind lifted the hair from his forehead he tried to give a cowpuncher's yell of joy from out of his throat came only a cracked and raucous rumble the man was shorty he crept back into the tunnel and whispered hoarsely the good news men came out on all fours over the bodies of those who could not move shorty dragged dave into the open he was a sorry sight the shirt had been almost literally burned from his body in the fresh air the men revived quickly they went back into the cavern and dragged out those of their companions not yet able to help themselves three out of every twenty-nine would never help themselves again they had perished in the tunnel. End of chapter 39Chapter 40 of Gunsight Pass How Oil Came to the Cattle Country and Brought a New West by William McLeod Rain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Message The women of Malafi responded generously to the call Joyce made upon them to back their men in the fight against the fire in the chaparral. They were simple folks of a generation not far removed from the pioneer one which had settled the country some of them had come across the plains in white-topped movers wagons others had lain awake in anxiety on account of raiding indians on the warpath all had lived lives of frugal usefulness it is characteristic of the frontier that its inhabitants help each other without stint when the need for service arises now they cooked and baked cheerfully to supply the wants of the firefighters joyce was in command of the commissary department she ordered and issued supplies checked up the cooked food and arranged for its transportation to the field of battle the first shipment went out about the middle of the afternoon of the first day of the fire a second one left town just after midnight a third was being packed during the forenoon of the second day though joyce had been up most of the night she showed no signs of fatigue in spite of her slenderness the girl was possessed of a fine animal vigor there was vitality in her crisp tread she was a decisive young woman who got results competently a bustling old lady with the glow of winter apples in her wrinkled cheeks remonstrated with her you can't do it all dearie if i was you i'd go home and rest now take a nice long nap and you'll feel real fresh she said i'm not tired replied joyce not a bit think of those poor men out there fighting the fire day and night i'd be ashamed to quit the old lady's eyes admired the clean fragrant girl packing sandwiches she sighed regretfully not long since as her memory measured time she too had boasted a clear white skin that flushed to a becoming pink on her smooth cheeks when occasion called ah well i 
well dearie ye never be young but once make ye the most of it she said a dream in her faded eyes out of the heart of the girl a full-throated laugh welled i'll do just that auntie then i'll grow some day into a nice old lady like you joyce recurred to business in a matter-of-fact voice how many more of them ham sandwiches are there mrs kent about sunset joyce went home to see that keith was behaving properly and snatched two hours sleep while she could another shipment of food had to be sent out that night and she did not expect to get to bed till well into small hours keith was on hand when she awakened to beg for permission to go out to the fire i'll carry water joy to the men well, someone's got carry it ain't they and if i don't maybe a man'll have to the young mother shook her head decisively no keithie you're too little grow real fast and you'll be a big boy soon you don't ever let me have any fun he pouted i gotta go to bed and sleep and sleep and sleep she had no time to stay and comfort him he pulled away sulkily from her good-night kiss and refused to be placated as she moved away into the darkness it gave joyce a tug of the heart to see his small figure on the porch for she knew that as soon as she was out of sight he would break down and wail he did keith was of that temperament which wants what it wants when it wants it after a time his sobs subsided there wasn't much use crying when nobody was around to pay any attention to him he went to bed and to sleep it was hours later that the voice of someone calling penetrated his dreams keith woke up heard the sound of a knocking on the door and went to the window the cook was deaf as a post and would never hear his sister was away perhaps it was a message from his father a man stepped out from the house and looked up at him miss crawford is she at home maybe so he asked the man was a mexican wait a jiffy i'll get up the youngster called back he hustled into his clothes went down and opened the door the senorita is she at home the man asked again she's down at the boston emporium cutting sandwiches and packing em keith said who wants her i haven't known for her from senor sanders master keith seized his opportunity promptly i'll take you down there the man brought his horse from the hitching rack across the road side by side they walked downtown the youngster talking excitedly about the fire the mexican either keeping silence or answering with a brief si sí, muchacho in the boston emporium keith raced ahead of the messenger joy joy a man wants to see you from dave he shouted joyce flushed perhaps she would have preferred not to have her private business shouted out before a room full of women but she put a good face on it a letter senorita the man said presenting her with a note which he took from his pocket the note read miss joyce your father has been hurt in the fire this man will take you to him dave sanders joyce went white to the lips and caught at the table to steady herself is is he badly hurt she asked the man took refuge in ignorance as mexicans do when they do not want to talk he did not understand english he said and when the girl spoke in spanish he replied sulkily that he did not know what was in the letter he had been told to deliver it and bring the lady back that was all keith burst into tears he wanted to go to his father too he sobbed the girl badly shaken herself and soul could not refuse him if his father was hurt he had a right to be with him you may ride along with me she said her lip trembling the women gathered around the boy and his sister expressing sympathy after the universal fashion of their sex they were kinder and more tender than usual pressing on them offers of supplies and service joyce thanked them a lump in her throat but it was plain that the only way in which they could help was to expedite her setting out soon they were on the road keith riding behind his sister and clinging to her waist joyce had slipped a belt around the boy and fastened it to herself so that he would not fall from the saddle in case he slept the mexican rode in complete silence for an hour they jogged along the dusty road which led to the new oil field then swung to the right into the low foothills among which the mountains were rooted joyce was a bit surprised 
she asked questions and again received for answers shrugs and voluble spanish irrelevant to the matter the young woman knew that the battle was being fought among the canyons leading to the plains this trail must be a short cut to one of them she gave up trying to get information from her guide he was either stupid or sulky perhaps a little of each the hill trail went up and down it dipped into valleys meandered around hills it climbed a mountain spur slipped through a notch and plumped sharply into a small mountain park at the notch the mexican drew up and pointed a finger in the dim pre-dawn grayness joyce could see nothing but a gulf of mist over there senorita he waits where in the arroyo come they descended letting their horses pick their way down cautiously through the loose rubble of the steep pitch the heart of the girl beat fast with anxiety about her father with the probability that dave sanders would soon come to meet her out of the silence with some vague prescience of unknown evil clutching at her bosom there had been growing in joyce a feeling that something was wrong something sinister was at work which she did not understand a mountain corral took form in the gloom the mexican slipped the bars of the gate to let the horses in is he here joyce asked breathlessly the man pointed to a one-room shack huddled on the hillside keith had fallen sound asleep his head against the girl's back don't wake him when you lift him down she told the man i'll just let him sleep if he will the mexican carried keith to a pile of sheepskins under a shed and lowered him to them gently the boy stirred turned over but did not awaken joyce ran toward the shack there was no light in it no sign of life about the place she could not understand this surely someone must be looking after her father whoever this was must have heard her coming why had he not appeared at the door dave of course might be away fighting fire but someone her heart lost a beat the shadow of some horrible thing was creeping over her life was her father dead what shock was awaiting her in the cabin at the door she raised her voice in a faint ineffective call her knees gave way she felt her body shaken as with an ague but she clenched her teeth on the weakness and moved into the room it was dark darker than outdoors but as her eyes grew accustomed to the absence of light she made out a table a chair a stove from the far side of the room came a gurgle that was half a snore father she whispered and moved forward her outstretched hand groped for the bed and fell on clothing warm with heat transmitted from a human body at the same time she subconsciously classified a strong odor that permeated the atmosphere it was whiskey the sleeper stirred uneasily beneath her touch she felt stifled wanted to shout out her fears in a scream far beyond the need of proof she knew now that something was very wrong though she still could not guess at what the dreadful menace was but joyce had courage she was what the wind and the sun and the long line of sturdy ancestors had made her she leaned forward toward the awakening man just as he turned in the bunk a hand fell on her wrist and closed the fingers like bands of iron joyce screamed wildly her nerves swept away in a reaction of terror she fought like a wildcat twisting and writhing with all her supple strength to break the grip on her arm for she knew now what the evil was that had been tolling a bell of warning in her heart end of chapter forty